EMSO is very proud of its up and coming young scientists. Uh, Kirsten Hofmarko is EMSO lead scientist for integrative research. She started as an EMSO user and came to us from University of Iowa in 2015. Kirsten is an early career award, research award winner from DOE, and her focus is on important and rapidly advancing field of soil biogeochemistry. Kirsten. Thank you, Liyuan. So thanks so much to Don and Liyuan for the invitation to speak here. It's really a privilege and it's a little bit humbling after all of the other talks that have happened, I feel like such a neophyte. Um, I also feel like I have this huge advantage because I get to build on the breadth and depth of expertise in this amazing foundation. Um, and it's funny coming here because I feel like, um, you know how birders, like they wanna get their list of, of birds or, or like mountaineers wanna bag peaks. That's kind of how I feel here. Cause I'm like, how many instruments can I touch with my soil to really ask impactful questions? And you know, you feel like the girl coming out of swamp where I've got like my mucky boots on and I want to get in a Lamborghini, you know, getting soils on a precision instrument is not an easy feat. And so somewhere like EMSL is great because scientists don't balk when I say like, I have soil that I want to run on your super fine machine that runs so well, right? And in fact, they embrace the challenge. So when I first arrived here, it was sort of this thing where I would was waiting for someone to say, we can't do that. And I never hit that, I have yet to hit that wall, right? And so I can have my super salty samples and I bring them to the metabolomics group and they're like, oh, you know, we actually have, a, we've been waiting for that question, right? We have this, this application that you can use, we have this instrument and this method that you can apply your question to. Um, so today I'd just like to talk to you about my experience as a user and sort of my vision moving forward in my new position as lead scientist for integrative research. One of the major challenges in systems biology is understanding how cellular processes interact to confer community and ecosystem functions. Um, and so my work focuses on this in the context of how plant microbe interactions regulate ecosystem processes and particularly coupled carbon nitrogen cycling. And I work on this in a variety of ecosystems ranging from boreal forests to wetlands to grasslands, agroecosystems. And we're always asking these questions about how coupled carbon nitrogen cycling is influenced by cellular and um, plant microbe interactions. So what I have depicted here is just a sort of a generic image of how environmental change, it could be drought, it could be some sort of management, um, but it can confer changes below ground. So we can see changes in plant inputs, whether that's the quantity or quality of root inputs that can affect microbial function and the interactions with the substrate. So it can change soil aggregation. It can change the physical protection of carbon and nitrogen. It can affect the release of nutrients into the atmosphere or into aquatic systems. But it's this, this microscopic view here that's really puzzling. And um, it's, we don't know, it's, it's a highly heterogeneous system. And one of the major blockers is we don't have eyes. We can't see what's going on in the system. So we're really working blind in what's, what's been um, called the most complex matrix on the planet. So the question is basically, how do plant microbe interactions influence this coupled cycling? And one of the things I think is really exciting about coming to EMSL and what drew me here is that I'm, as an ecosystem ecologist or biogeochemist, this is our bread and butter conceptual model. We have these pools and fluxes, and a lot of our models are based on this. And what happens at EMSL is we can open these up and start to have a molecular understanding. So instead of having microbial biomass, we can start to look at the organisms that are in there. Instead of saying decomposition and just having a rate, we can start to look at the specific enzymes that are, are working under different conditions. Instead of just talking about stabilization, we can think about the chemistry that's happening there and the mineral, mineral organic interactions and the mineral microbe interactions. So coming into EMSL, this, this conceptual diagram starts to look very different. In order to advance this understanding of ecosystem biogeochemistry, we need to have a molecular understanding. So this means that we need field relevant experiments that connect across temporal and spatial scales. The goal of my work is to understand how molecules 
impact microorganisms and their interactions in their natural habitat. And the implication that this has for biogeochemical processes happening in the soil profile, and ultimately it influences ecosystem dynamics. And what we want to do is really get away from these site-specific or event-specific reactions to the generalizable principles that then we can start to model and have a predictive understanding. And that also can lead to um, greater productivity in terms of the way that we manage our lands and greater resilience against different environmental changes. So my first um, endeavor here was as a user, and I was part of the inaugural FICUS program, which is between um, multiple user facilities. And so in this case, I was awarded access to the MSOL as well as JGI. And in the proposal writing process, I had the very good fortune of somehow networking my way into Gallia Orr's um, realm. And so I had this conversation with her on the phone where I really had very little understanding of what was possible at EMSL. Um, but I had a question, and I had a hypothesis, and I was blocked. And so I had this conversation with her, and she is this amazingly curious mind, and, and worked with me to develop um, an idea about how we could test my hypothesis. And what I found here is EMSL is that, is that um, fearless curiosity is rampant here. And I think that's one of the best parts about this institution is that it's, you're, you're able to do boundaryless, boundaryless science, right? So um, what I felt really happy about here when I first arrived um, is that I didn't have to be pegged as a biologist. And often I would sit in these meetings and I would have thought someone else had some domain. And when they would go around the table and introduce themselves, like their PhD was in, a, in something that really sort of surprised me. Um, and I think that's what's really great about um, working here is that people are able to think about problems and try to answer them um, regardless of the disciplinary boundaries. Oh, so my research was about understanding the decomposition of plant detritus. I was really interested in cellulose degrading microorganisms, how they break down plant material in the environment, um, and the specific enzymatic and um, microbial interactions that regulate this in biofuel, um, biofuel plots. And so this is a ficus research um, opportunity that I did in collaboration with the um, cell isolation and systems analysis lab that Gallia Orr works with. Um, and so I had this, I had had previously this um, DOE, USDA, um, NASA grant, the ROSES program, where I was working on these questions at the ecosystem scale, really doing a lot of biogeochemistry. And I was, I was working on some of these enrichment cultures, trying to understand the microbial community dynamics. And when I talked to Gallia, she had this idea, she had this collaborator here, um, Jay Great, who's a fellow at the lab. He had developed these fluorescently labeled cellulose nanocrystals. And we thought, well, what if we feed those to the microbes? And then we can start to actually track the microorganisms and see them, which as a soil ecologist, anytime you have an opportunity to see what's going on in your system, it really changes the way you think about things. So now all of a sudden I have charismatic microbes that are pink, which is super exciting as well. So, um, so and now instead of working on dirt, you know, everybody wants to work with the pink microbes in my lab, so that was exciting. Um, so we grew these microbes, they ate the cellulose, um, and then Gallia could image them in her lab and Will Chrysler, and so we could see the cells, we could label them to see if they're active and they were happy growing on the cellulose. We could change the channels and look at the cellulose there and, and differentiate it from the microbes, and then we could overlay these to see which microorganisms were associating or assimilating the cellulose. So this now means that we could cell sort, and we can start to isolate um, organisms that are not culturable, but that we can grow them up in the lab and we can start to functionally isolate them. Then coupled with the JGI, which is a wonderful thing, these ficus, I think, that really generates collaborations between the national labs and a broader way of asking questions. So now we can start to look at who's there and, and we had, have metatranscript domes to look at how that decomposition um, happens over time. And fortunately, I was clever enough to archive some of my samples. So now that I'm here, there's an opportunity to start applying the metabolomics to this, to start thinking about the proteomics, to use activity-based probes. So there's a lot of tools that we can put to, together to test these hypotheses. So this was like such a great experiment. Um, it allowed me to start to think about molecules, to start to think about this ecosystem question. You know, I'm working in field plots doing biogeochemistry, and now I can start to think about the molecules and how they're impacting these ecosystem scale processes. And I think that's one of the really great um, signatures of EMSL is, is working across scales 
And I think that's something they're really great at. And, um, um, and I think there's lots of opportunities here as well to start delving into the math and the, and the compute opportunities to start bridging here um, for in my domain. So um, that work was so wonderful and I kind of fell madly in love with EMSL and then I came here and now I'm part of the staff as a lead scientist and the work we're doing now is in collaboration with the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Station. There's several colleagues here that are working in this collaboration. This is um, a long-term ecosystem experiment and I guess I'll just give a shout out for the DOE for supporting these kinds of experiments because they support these manipulative, large-scale, long-term ecosystem experiments and they're so valuable for answering these questions about below ground ecology and ecosystem responses, right? So at this stage to be able to walk into an experiment that's got a decade of treatments is really special, especially because my questions are about carbon stabilization. And so to ask those questions under a field treatment that's four years, five years, it's really hard to find meaningful results about, about stabilization, right? When we talk about like long-term carbon storage, it's not two or three years. And so to be able to walk into an experiment that's got a decade of these treatment effects, we can really start to ask meaningful questions about how carbon is cycled within the ecosystems. So with this particular experimental design, which is great as well, because it's not just an ecosystem experiment, but it's a landscape scale experiment. So we have two field sites that differ in their soils. One is a sandy loam and the other is a silt loam. Um, and they have the same cropping system treatments. So it allows us to look at mineralogy and how it might impact these plant microbe interactions. Um, and so the central hypothesis is that these plant microbe interactions are limited to influencing the rate of carbon accrual. So I think the carbon accrual is typically what we're measuring on these short term experiments. We can look at carbon being pumped into the system and often people want to call that increased sequestration or increased carbon storage, but it's possibly a short term because it's still in a form that's highly accessible. So if you have a long drought and then a flood release, a lot of that can get pulsed off or if you have other extreme weather events, you can pulse off some of that into the atmosphere. What's more interesting, I think, is mineralogy. And there's a hypothesis that this could be what really regulates the long-term carbon storage. And, and this is really important because if we think we're going to increase carbon storage on marginal lands, but we can't because of the mineralogy, then we need to confront that in terms of how we're deploying our, our agroecosystems and our biofuel systems. And I would put forth to you that I think that the soil health and the ability to store carbon is, is central to the security of our nation because fertile soils are necessary for food production. They're necessary for fuel production. They're necessary for fiber production. If you don't have healthy soils, you can't use it as a living filter to provide clean water. So soils provide all sorts of functions that are critical to the habitability of our planet. And I would just put forth that they're extremely important um, and worth investing in. So one of the things we can do is look at how bacterial communities differ and fungal communities differ across these cropping systems. And I bring this up not because the results are particularly surprising. We do find differences with cropping systems and mineralogy. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that these sort of data are, have become vernacular. They have been democratized in a large part because of the work that JGI has done. And in soils, it was really more ANL, uh, Argon, where they had their um, Earth Microbiome Project. And that was the, my first ability to sequence soils. And those endeavors really made sequencing accessible to the point where now having, um, being able to do shotgun sequencing is available at almost all institutions. Many labs can do their own amplicon sequencing. Um, and I think this is part of the future of EMSL is democratizing some of our capabilities. So when I first came here and even still now, I'm overwhelmed with the opportunities here and, uh, and spend a lot of time getting schooled on what the different, um, capabilities are and how they can be applied in my domain. And I think the opportunity to, to make that part of the vernacular for ecosystem ecologists and for other types of scientists, that they really understand these data and how to use them. And as um, our previous spoke, speaker said, um, Dr. Ramesh at one point said, um, I'm not an expert on this, but he's presenting the data, right? And so there's a possibility for us to say, I'm not an expert in proteomics, but I understand the data that have been generated by EMSL and they help me to test hypotheses and generate new hypotheses. So this is super exciting because this is my first ICR data. Um, this is the soil chemistry at the sites. And this is a fairly um, like lovely graph for soil ecologists. <laughs> 
Um, you know, I had one of my um, students come to me and say, we're going to ESA next week. And she said, you know, I want to know what, what's a good R squared. You know, my R squareds are like 0.6. And I was like, yes, we're reporting those. That's great. You know, like I was like, if we get above 0.3, we're like 30% correlation. Like that's worth talking about. Below that, like, you know, and if your p-values are strong. So here, like, this is really interesting, the way that the sites and the soils differentiate. We can see that the corn systems are quite separate from the um, switchgrass systems in our ordination. And similarly, we see differentiation between the mineralogy where the sandy sites and the clay loam sites have um, really seen to separate out. And then we can start to look at what compounds are associated with this, and we can generate specific hypotheses about why corn systems on a sandy soil might have a different soil chemistry than clay soils with switchgrass. And we can investigate these further through um, incubation experiments and some other culturing experiments um, in order to ask these questions about how carbon is stored in the long term. I think another major frontier for the lab and a great opportunity is through stable isotope probing. Um, and I'm really excited that this is starting to ramp up at EMSL. And I think this is um, something that will bring a whole new genre of users to the lab. And it also really allows us to ask these complicated questions within the soil. So by having a stable isotope, we can um, track molecules in the system without disturbing the system. So we can let it have its in situ cycling, its native um, biogeochemistry, and yet we have a molecule to trace it. And for ecologists, um, isotopes are, we have a long history of working with isotopes, not at the molecular scale, not compound specific, right? But stable isotopes is in our tool shed. And so that's something that can really bring in a lot of new users and enable us to answer new questions. And it's particularly exciting with the multi-omics techniques because there's many challenges to doing multi-omics, especially in soils, because there's so many thousands of molecules. And so when you have a tracer, it allows you to start targeting your studies and it allows you to design experiments and develop standards and get into a quantitative molecular understanding of below ground biogeochemistry. And that's a huge frontier that will change the way that we can mathematically model the way that ecosystems are responding. Okay, the other awesome thing about EMSL is um, imaging. So this is um, my first SEM of my soils, which we all celebrated in the lab for like weeks. We're super happy and I love showing this off whenever I go anywhere because nobody gets to look at their soils. And in fact, in one of our workshops in January, we had a user from the USGS come here and she said, you know, I wasn't even asking these questions and I saw these microbes growing on the minerals and now I have all these new hypotheses that I'm unqualified to test and we're not anywhere in my wheelhouse, but they're so interesting, right? So for us to be able to visualize our soils really changes our perception. You look at this and you're like, well, of course, Kirsten, these are gonna respond really differently. Your sandy soil has a smooth surface. It doesn't really look like a great place for a microbe to inhabit, nor to sequester carbon. When you look at the clay loams, it's a completely heterogeneous landscape where you would expect there to be diverse niche space for microbes to make a living and also a great opportunity for carbon to be stored and for there to be these organic mineral interactions. Okay, so to advance this ecosystem understanding, I'll just um, sort of close this out of saying that I think that EMSL has, has been demonstrated in these talks. You know, they're fabulous across all different scales of biological understanding. And it kind of cracks me up because when I first got here, we would spend some time talking about like, well, what's EMSL great at? And there would be like quiet. And I was like, why is it quiet? We're great at so many things. But the problem is like, which thing, right? And it reminds me when I take my kids into like a candy store and, and you're like, okay, you know, you have $5. What do you want to buy? And, and they just stand there. And you're like, come on, you're like, you know what you want. There's right. But they, it's like, this is a very, very important decision. And there's like way too many choices, right? And so it's the same way when you're like, well, what's Ansel good at? It's like, well, it depends on the audience, right? because we're good at so many things and we have so much depth of understanding. Um, and so I think what the frontier now is, is the bridges. So I think we're actually quite good at many of the boxes in this diagram, but where we can really make a difference is to, is the, like those blue connectors and start, and start integrating between these areas and start integrating across scales. And I think for my science, you know, at the multi-omics technique, many of us were asking this question, it, not in the talks, but sort of, in the social sessions about, well, what's the right granularity to ask our question, right? So, and a lot of times scientists are working at the scale that their tools provide. But I think what's really exciting about this molecular understanding is we might find a marker molecule that, can, that we can 
use to understand how ecosystems are responding, right? So I'm not saying like everybody has to have a multi-omic understanding of every single ecosystem, but we might be able to find these, these important molecules that are really the transfer across scales. And so we can understand how ecosystems are functioning. And I think there's a huge opportunity at this lab in particular, given our strengths in math and modeling and the open-mindedness. Um, okay, so I'll close up with our vision, just reflecting on that. Um, you know, there were some jokes about pioneers, but truly there are pioneers in this room and, and I am gonna benefit from all of them. So thank you for all of the hard work that you've done. Um, and that, you know, there are these great discoveries happening and that we're mobilizing the scientific community. And I'll just close with one comment about that. As I remember, um, Harvey and I had taken a trip together and we were at the airport on a delay or something. We were chatting and I was saying like, God, the people at Emsel are so nice. Like, they're so great. You know, everybody's like willing to help me. And he, he kind of looked at me like I was weird. And I was like, well, um, yeah, but like there's no, like people aren't like territorial or competitive in house. Like people are really generous. And he was like, well, Kirsten, it's a user facility. It self-selects for that, right? Like if you don't like people and you don't like collaborating, you don't end up in a user facility. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. But <laughs> so we don't talk about that much, but it's unique in my experience. It's unique in my experience. And I don't think everywhere is like that. And I don't know that every national lab is like that. And so I think it's something definitely worth fostering and definitely worth celebrating as we have our festivities for this 20th anniversary, that the culture here and our ability to really do boundaryless collaborative research is something special. And I feel so privileged to be a part of it. So thank you.